So why don't we get started, if you're ready. Put on your seatbelts. <laughs> but we'll get started with a little story. I want you to remember that God, God's created everything you see. He breathed it into existence. You remember when his people were caught up in slavery? He rescued them. What he did was he parted the sea and he made a way for them and then he delivered their enemies to them and he unlocks wounds and he provides water from a rock and he provides manna from heaven and he brought down the walls of Jericho. He froze the sun allowing victory. He's toppled giants with tiny stones. He's brought fire from heaven. He shut the mouths of lions. He preserved life in the belly of a well. He's fed thousands with a few loaves. He gives the weak strength. He heals the sick. He's made the the blind see, the deaf ear, the mute speak, the lame walk, and he's overcome evil, and he's made a way through death for you and me by the death and the resurrection as a son, Jesus Christ, that we will live with him forever. We will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever and ever and ever. What are we afraid of? His resume is flawless. He controls everything. And he loves you. What are we afraid of? What are that? What is that 62%, 61%? What are they so afraid of that they are willing to buy into the opinions of human beings about the way things should be and sacrifice how God thinks that things should be? What's going on? What are we afraid of? Are we afraid of the crowd? Are we afraid of the culture? Are we afraid of the screaming voices on social media? Because all of those things are trying to silence you. They're trying to intimidate you into abandoning what God says is true. What God says is true about how you and I ought to live what things we should celebrate, what things we should esteem. And I have, I'm here to warn you. Remember, I am not a prophet, but I stand in their sandals. I sit in the seat of Moses. Not because I am him, but because God called me to take the words of the prophets and bring it to you. And I have warned you repeatedly that I have had what I would consider to be a word from the Lord. That the days of the persecution of Nero, the emperors, that our ancestors suffered in the first century, it is upon you. And that's not a warning in order to abandon being true to what God's word says in order to avoid that. Because that's what's going on. These, these people are so afraid of the crowd. They're so afraid of being offensive by saying that God actually has a standard for how we should live. And people are so afraid of standing on that because they're afraid of that kind of persecution. I'm not telling you that that kind of persecution isn't coming. I'm telling you it's on your doorstep. But the solution is not to run away from what God says or to be ashamed of it, but instead to double down and embrace it. Because how many of you know that if you stand true to the last day, your king will come and get you? That's what he said. That's what he said, and he has never let anyone down. His resume, say it with me, is flawless. Now we're studying the book of Isaiah. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 1. It says, The word which Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Now we're going to kind of camp there for a moment. We, we've talked about this before, that Isaiah 
being a prophet, it says several times in his book that he saw these things. So these are visions. They are a, uh, he was awake, but it's a dreamlike state. He actually saw these things. And w- when he saw these things, the Holy Spirit worked through him to write down what he saw. It was a supernatural thing. And we, th- this is a very important thing to note. This is not just a fire and brimstone preacher from the 8th century before Christ that we're talking about. We are talking about the spirit of the living God who moved through the prophet in order to write down words that mattered then and matter now. And it's supernatural. Now, critics of the Bible, they absolutely, utterly hate the books of prophecy. They hate them. Because if prophecy is real, that means the God that we're talking about is real. Now, this is important because our culture has no problem with you believing in God so long as it's generic. You believe in your best guess about God, okay? They have no problem with that. But when you start talking about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that's specific. And when you start saying that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is the one and only true God, and there is no other, and that all other ideas about God are false, now everybody's upset. And they don't like that. And so if, if, you know, if we're talking about a God who transcends, that is greater than nature, then this is a God who indeed can tell the future. But you have critics who utterly hate this book and they complain about prophecy because they suggest that, well, there's no such thing as miracles. So that means that this book of prophecy must have been written after the events that it talks about because they don't believe in predictive prophecy. But as soon as the critics make all of their arguments and try, God just laughs. He really does, because we have so much evidence coming out of the ground that indeed the book of Isaiah was written in the 8th century before Christ, long before the events that he prophesied, long before. Now, that's scary to the critics, because if it's true, and it is true, then that means that the God we're talking about really is the one and only true God. Somebody say, amen, Amen. because that's what we're talking about. We're talking about the God that the Bible teaches us really exists. Now, it's important for us to understand a biblical worldview if only 4% of professing Christians even hold it. So I'm going to start over the next 10, 12, 15 years or so to constantly point out to you what is a biblical worldview point that you, a bullet point that you need to get. Well, here's one of them. Who is this God that we're talking about? Isaiah, or I'm sorry, Exodus chapter 3 verse 14 says that when Moses was asking God, well, who are you? In other words, tell me what your nature is. Who am I talking to here? And God said what? I am. Now what he meant by this is he's the self-existent one. So that's a worldview. That's a biblical worldview. We believe that God is transcendent to God. Nature. That means he is not part of nature. Transcendent means beyond. So he's outside of time. He's timeless. He's outside of space. He's spaceless. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere present. He's beyond matter. He's not physical. The Bible says God is a spirit. They that worship him must worship him in what? Spirit and in truth. Now this makes sense when you think it through based on the evidence that we have from science, from physics, and all those sorts of things because the evidence is overwhelming that the universe as we know it, I mean this evidence is so overwhelming that even atheists like uh, Stephen Hawkins, even Richard Dawkins will agree that the universe had a sudden beginning out of nothing. Now, even a five-year-old can tell you that you cannot get something from nothing. So it, it only makes sense since all the evidence says the entire physical universe came into existence out of nothing suddenly by a gigantic explosion. Well, what explosion? Scientists call it the Big Bang. The Bible calls it in the beginning, God said. 
Okay? And so when God spoke, it was instantaneous. And God said, let there be light. And it was so. And the explosion of his power across the cosmos. And the emptiness filled with his light. Now we know, just, just by sheer logic, that the universe could not have created itself. There are plenty of scientists out there that try to argue that the universe created itself. But that's completely absurd, because in order to create itself, it would have had to exist before it existed in order to create itself. How many of you know you cannot exist before you exist to make yourself exist? That does not work. Okay, and so they say, well, you know, the laws of nature, the laws of physics, that's what... Well, what are the laws? Are they material? Are they made out of atoms? What are laws? Ooh, I just took you to another level. Because you can't define them as physical things at all. So how can they create? They can't. They don't create, they describe. Let that in, in your head. The laws of physics and everything, they don't create anything. They only describe what is happening. They're like guardrails. They're simply governing agents, which means they could not have been in existence unless there was a universe for them to govern. So any way you look at it, the evidence says there once was nothing. But if it was truly, truly nothing, then there would still be nothing right now. The only thing that fits the evidence is that there must be a being who is transcendent. He's not physical, he's spirit. He's eternal. He does not owe his existence to anyone or anything he has no beginning. He has no end. He is. This is Yahweh, the great I am, the one who spoke to Moses, the one who called Abraham, the one who parted the Red Sea, the one who called it all into existence out of nothing by his mighty power. This is the God that we are talking about. And if he wants to give a man a vision, and it's about the future, he can. <laughs> That's who we're talking about. Now, people don't like that. They don't like that. But you know, this God, if you think about it for a second, remember, an effect can only have what it has if it gets it from its cause. But what is this universe? What is this stage? What is this? It's all made out of protons, neutrons, and electrons. Everything around you. The air you're breathing the ground beneath your feet. It is all protons, neutrons, and electrons. And if we get down deep enough, what are they? They are simply energy. And what is the visible form of energy? Come on, physics majors. Light. And what did God create first? Let there be light. And from that, he created absolutely everything else. So the God who has the power to light the protons and to get the electrons spinning around, the God who can do that, I'm not worried about his claim that he knows the future. Are you? You see, this is the God that made the stars, which means he has all knowledge because he's smart enough to design and build these. And the Bible says he knows every single one of them by name. He knows their positions and not one of them is lost. How many stars are there? Well, scientists say roughly 10 to the 80th. That's a one with 80 zeros behind it, for those of you that are math majors. That's a big number. In fact, if you counted one ordinal number every second, like this, one, two, three, right about this speed, 120 beats per minute, right about here, and you just started counting, one, two, three, four, and then just start counting, and keep going 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and do not stop. You know, after 30 billion years of doing that, you'll get to 10 to the 18th. So when we talk about 10 to the 80th stars and God knows every single one of them by name, how many of you know he's a whole lot smarter than you? How many of you believe that? How many? I want to see your hands. How many of you believe that he's smarter than you? Good. I'm so glad the class is learning. And you know, the God who is outside of time and space and matter. What do we mean by outside of time? Because people get freaked about that. Well, it's because you don't understand how God views things. See, you and I, 
We are within time, but God is outside. So how does this work? Well, it's kind of like a timeline. I mean, if you look at this timeline here, you are here. <laughs> okay. In other words, you're in that dot. You're inside that dot as it moves along the timeline. But right now, where you're sitting, you are omniscient. Because you see all of this at once. You're not in the dot right now because you're sitting out there. Does that make sense? In the same way, God is outside. He sees all of time just like this in one gigantic instantaneous now, which means he knows the future every bit as well as he knows the present and every bit as well as he knows the past, which is why he could say to Isaiah, Isaiah, write this down. They're going to need this in 17 centuries, but you just write it down right how many of you know Isaiah didn't know how long it was going to be before it mattered what he said? But he was in the dot way back here somewhere. But God sees it all at once. This is the God who knows the future. So Isaiah saw because God opened up his eyes probably to see something like this. I don't know. Let's take a look. Verse 2. Boy, we're doing well. Now it will come about that in the last days the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains and will be raised above the hills and all the nations will stream to it. Now when he talks about in the last days, that is a figure of speech in the Hebrew language. And it always refers to the end of normal human history. The prophets have been talking about this since Moses. And what they've been saying is, is that there's going to come a time, there's going to come a point when God is done with the rebellion of men. That day is coming. And when it does, Yeshua, Messiah, Jesus, is going to rule physically from this planet as king. And who's going to argue with him? Somebody say, nobody. He will be king and he will rule with a rod of iron, it says. And where is he going to rule from? Well, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Revelation, they all say the same thing. Jerusalem. This is where he's going to rule from, but not just the Jerusalem as we see it now. I've been to Jerusalem. How many of you have been to Jerusalem? Okay, now Jerusalem today is in some places 40, 50 feet above the, what, where it was in the first century. That's how far down they got to dig in order to get there in certain places in the city. So it's, it's, it, it doesn't look to me now. I loved Jerusalem. Don't get me wrong. I loved it. I loved walking through the markets and the smells of all of the spices and all the people in the different languages. It was a wonderful, bizarre kind of a place to go. Beautiful. And I loved it. And it's Jerusalem. But it won't look like that in his day. It's going to be remade. How is it going to be re remade? Well, the biblical worldview is this, that eventually human rebellion against God is going to reach a point where it was as it was in the days of Lot, where it was, Yeshua said, like it was in the days of Noah, where people, the majority of them will not know him the majority, that rebellion will reach a point, a specific point of intensity that only God knows. And it will be at this point that God's judgment will begin to fall on the earth over a seven-year time period. But just before that seven-year time period begins, our master is going to miraculously call us up out of this existence into our resurrection bodies instantaneously. And that is the rapture. And that day is coming. We don't know when. Could be today. This afternoon would be fine with me. How many of you vote for this evening? I do. How many of you know you don't care what your vote is? Just checking if you understood that. You know, an answer to you. <laughs> but so before this judgment, now what's going to happen in this judgment? Well, the first, after we get called away, the first three and a half years of that judgment is called the tribulation. And it's during this time period, you can read about it in a number of different places, but particularly in Revelation chapter 8. And you will see that the judgments that come at this time are still warnings. They're, they're still partial. Like in Revelation 8, 7, it says, 
A third of the earth is burned in the, and, and a third of the trees. A third of the sea is turned into blood. A third of the waters are poisoned and so on. It's still only partial for the first three and a half years. But at about three, at three and a half years in, the Antichrist is going to take off the gloves. He's going to openly declare in the temple in Jerusalem that he is God and that everybody must worship him and that no one can buy or sell on the entire globe without being swearing loyalty to him. That's going to happen three and a half years in. And at that point, the Bible says, in Revelation in particular, but in a number of places that God's judgments, his final judgments, will begin to pour out without restraint. And this is what we call the great tribulation. That's the, that's the part where Jesus in Matthew 24 said that if God did not shorten this time period, no flesh would survive it. That's how bad it will get. Now, what's interesting here, and some people, you know, maybe they read past this or didn't think about it. But the truth is, we find in the book of Revelation in particular, but also in Ezekiel, we find that there are at least five different major earthquakes that are going to happen during the tribulation and great tribulation. Five. The last one is the one that we really want to talk about the most. And it's in Revelation chapter 16 and verse 18. Let's read it. It says, there were flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder, and there was a great earthquake such as there had not been since mankind came to be upon the earth. So great an earthquake was it, and so mighty. The great city, that's Jerusalem, was split into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. Babylon the Great was remembered in the sight of God to give her the cup of the wine of his fierce wrath. And every island fled, and no mountains were found. I mean, this is an earthquake so severe that based on what I'm reading in Revelation and based on what I read in Ezekiel, it's literally going to reshape this planet. Now, what I mean by reshape is you have to understand that God has done this before. Because prior to Noah's flood, the earth was a very different place. Prior to Noah's flood, we, we had completely different land masses than we have today. And what happened during the flood event is what we call runaway plate tectonics. What happened is, for whatever reason, whether it was an earthquake, we don't know how God triggered it, but one way or another, there was a gigantic shift where the, what is today... The Pacific plate snapped off and dropped down into the Earth's mantle, which means it would have flash boiled trillions of tons of salt water instantaneously. And it rained 40 days and 40 nights. And when you drop an entire piece of the plate tectonics into the mantle like that, it's going to shift all the others. Just imagine, like, like pieces of of the shell of an egg, just, just shifting around like this. And that's what happened, which is why you had gigantic tidal waves that, that swarmed across the planet and then receded as the, the plates went up and down like this, just like over the, over the period of the a year of the flood. And it reshaped the planet from what used to be into what we live at now. We have Thousands of miles of sedimentary rock all across this planet. Just go up to the Grand Canyon. You can see plenty of it. That didn't exist in Noah's day. The earth was reshaped. It was reshaped then, and it's going to be reshaped again. In Revelation 16, now it, this earthquake is not only going to reshape everything, but according to this, it's going to lift Jerusalem and the entire part of, of, of what is today Israel up and everything else is going to drop and so it literally becomes the highest point on earth. Now there are some people that disagree with me, they're just wrong, and they say that what, <laughs> no, let's be nice, they're, they could be right, but let's get to the millennium and we'll all find out together, what do you say? Okay, but they could be right, okay, let's be honest, let's, let's be fair. They could, this could mean that Jerusalem is simply going to be the most prominent city in the world. But I don't think so because I, I think about the flood and I think about this earthquake and I think about, no, I think it's really going to lift 
Because I think a straight reading of this, a plain reading of this, tells us that Jerusalem will be split into three pieces. It will be raised up. In fact, there are other, you can read in Ezekiel, I think it's 18, where you can read about how this actually breaks open a spring and that water will flow out from underneath where the throne of Messiah will be in Jerusalem. And the water will run down and it's going to split the Mount of Olives and it's going to run through a new valley. And that water running all the way down will cleanse the Dead Sea and it'll become a major fishing spot. How many of you looking forward to this? Guys, 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 guys. Okay, it's going to be a lot of fun. Really good fishing. And so I'm really looking forward to that. But anyway, let's go on. Verse 3. I haven't offended anybody yet, but I'm getting there. Now, many peoples will come, and they will say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Yaakov, so that we may teach, so that he may teach us about his ways. Messiah, Yeshua, is going to literally teach the people directly his mouth to their ear. And you and I will be there to see it. For the law will go out from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem and he will judge between the nations and will mediate for many peoples and they will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning knives and nation will not lift up sword against nation and never again will they learn war. How many of you are combat vets and that's music to your ears? They will never learn war again. Why? Because any disputes between anyone will be settled by Yeshua himself. And how many of you know he's smarter than everybody? He's going to know exactly what to say. Exactly what judgment call to make. He will mediate with perfect judgment. Psalms tells us, I think it's Psalm 9. I could be wrong about that, but look it up. Um, that, That he is going to rule with literally an iron fist. No one. No one will dispute him. He will have absolute control over all nations worldwide for a thousand years. And you and I will be there as part of his administration. What we do here, what we do now, how we live, what we do with the gifts and the talents and the abilities that he's given us will be judged by him. And from what we do in this life, he will decide what responsibility you get, what responsibility you get, what responsibility you get, and so on, as part of the administration of this great kingdom. And I don't know if he's going to give me a broom closet to rule over, but it'll be a very nice broom closet if it is. I'll make sure it's in exact order when he shows up. And he'll say, oh, Pat, what a great broom closet. Thank you, boss. Because I don't care. I don't care if it's a broom closet. How many of you know I just want to be there? How many of you just want to be there? I don't care. I just want to be there. I just want to see it. And I will. You know why I'm going to see it? Because I'm covered by the blood of Yeshua. I put my faith in him, not in me. I haven't put my faith in my own good works. I put my faith on what he did in the cross. And because of that, I'm guaranteed. I'm going. I'm going. How many of you going too? How many of you going too? We're going to go there. We're going to see that. We're going to be there. It's going to be good. So he says, come now, house of Yaakov. And let's walk in the light of the Lord. In other words, you're seeing all this. I'm predicting all this. Well, why don't we walk in it now? Because here's what you are doing, is what Isaiah is saying. Because you have, right now, you've abandoned your people, the house of Yaakov. Why? Because they are filled with influences from the east. Ooh. And they are soothsayers. That means sorcerers, fortune tellers, like the Philistines. They also strike bargains with the children of foreigners. You see, they were, they were following occult practices. That's, that's what they were doing. You know what I mean? How many of you know that occult practices are every bit as silly as this picture? You see, now why were they doing that? Well, rather than trusting God's revelation about the future and how they should live, they, they, they were doing this kind of thing. Why were they doing this? Well, they got these ideas from the East. How many of you have heard that all the New Age stuff that is going on today is from where? The East. Okay, nothing new under the sun here. Okay, but, but why were they doing that? Because, you see, there's a temptation in human beings 
we look at God's revelation about the future, and it talks about nations. It doesn't talk about whether or not I should strike this business deal or that one, whether or not I should buy this house or that one, whether or not I should marry this person or that one. And because I don't have those kind of specifics, I do not read in the Bible, you know, we're, you know we, we're out looking for another property for the church to buy. And no, I won't let the cat out of the bag. I'm very careful. Because I'm under an NDA, which is called the Non-Disclosure Agreement. But all I can tell you is we're looking. And it's looking good. That's all I can tell you. But you can pray. But what do I do if I, I have choices here? Do I choose this or do I choose this? And I cannot look up a Bible and, in the Bible and, and find a chapter and verse that says, thou shalt pick A, not B. I don't have that. And because I don't have that, there's a temptation. We, we can get spooky as Christians. I don't go, well, you know, I felt a certain way. Well, you know what? If you eat enough jalapenos, you're going to feel a certain way. <laughs> That's not how you do it. No, God says, look, you put your trust in me. For it is written, it is good for man to make plans, but it is the Lord who directs his steps. And because I trust and I believe in that, I don't need to go, well, you know, I was walking down the street and I saw a black cat and a blue crow and this, that, and the other, and I felt this and all over here. No, that's not how you make decisions when it comes to being a Christian. When it comes to being a Christian, you pray about things and you're shrewd, wise, you look at it from a wisdom point of view and you trust that God will guide you, that he will open up the right doors and shut the other ones. You walk in that, that's called faith. But you see, they didn't want to do that because they wanted to, oh, I want an answer now. Well, what's that all about? That's about me running things instead of trusting God to run things. And so they started getting into the occult and their little Ouija boards and their little crystals and everything. How many of you know there's nothing new under the sun? Go to Sedona if you don't believe me. Verse 7, we're doing well. Their land has also been filled with silver and gold, and there's no end to their treasures. In other words, they're all about materialism and money. Sound familiar? Their land has also been filled with horses, and there is no end to their chariots. These are, these are signs of wealth. Their land has also been filled with idols. They worship the work of their hand that which their fingers have made. Now, this is a picture of materialism and stuffitis, is what I like to call it. But God is not against wealth. How do I know that? Some of the most godly men in all of history were very wealthy, like Abraham. God is not against wealth. What he's against is people who worship wealth, worship Success. What does it mean to worship these things? It means you are more loyal to gaining personal success than you are to living for your God. God becomes your good luck charm for your plan instead of you saying everything I do, everything I say, everything I think, everything you give me, I am loyal to you above it all. That's the difference. And when we start becoming more loyal to gaining wealth or success than to living for our God, then we've made our wealth into a God. And that's what idolatry is. And people worship the work of their hands, don't they? They worship their little businesses. I've seen the celebrities talking about their great careers. It's okay to have a good career, but not to worship it or worship yourself because where did you get the skills, talents, and abilities to be able to build that career, Mr. Celebrity? You got it. You didn't ask to be born. Okay, God did that. Verse 9. So the common person has been humbled, and the person of importance has been brought low. But do not forgive them. Ooh. Enter the rocky place and hide in the dust from the terror of the Lord and from the splendor of his majesty. See, judgment is coming. The proud look of humanity will be brought low and the arrogance of people will be humbled and the Lord alone will be exalted on that day. The Lord alone, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess he is Lord. He has the right to judge 
He has the right to command. When he says, do not forgive them, this is, again, this is a figure of speech. What he's saying is that the point is going to come. And this is, Jesus said the same thing, didn't he? It will be like it was in the days of Noah. What was it like in the days of Noah? There was only eight people left. Everybody else was out partying. They were out giving and taking in marriage and drinking and doing all these things until the rain began to fall, all the way up to the last possible moment. That's what's going on now. The world out there is just churning along 24 hours a day, seven days a week on its way to hell. When you and I stand on the sidelines and call out to them, be saved from this. You're on the wide path that's going over a cliff. Come down here, down in the narrow path. They don't want to do it because it's rocky and it's difficult and it's, that's, why should I go down that road? So the day is going to come when they're going to get so full of themselves that they wouldn't ask for forgiveness no matter what happens. And that's what we see in Revelation, isn't it? All these judgments begin to fall. What do they do? Do they finally turn? No. Read Revelation. They just double down. The more the, 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 the judgments come, the more clear it is till they get to a point where there's literally an angel going through the skies shouting in every language, return and repent, and yet they will curse God even though they see that. They will get to a point where there is no forgiveness. So he's not going to forgive them. Every person of importance will be brought low, but do not forgive them. That's where it's going to get. That's what's coming. See, it's starting now. We learned in 2 Thessalonians that the final days, the rapture, the, this whole thing that we're talking about is not going to begin until there is an apostasy, a falling away first. Remember we talked about that? How many of you know that if 65% of professing believers, 60, what, 61% of them do not have a biblical worldview, they don't actually believe, they say they're Christians, but they ain't. You only got 4%. How many of you know we're in the middle of that falling away right now? And what is that falling away? We talked about it. It's not just abandoning Christian belief. What it is, is it's civil war. It's, that's what apostasia means. It's where they're, they're not only abandoning what we believe, but they're coming and attacking you and I for standing on a literal interpretation of what God's word says. We become the enemy. And that's where we're at. See, people today, they live for self, not God. Self is everything. Making yourself happy is everything in this culture. We we watched, remember the videos from last week? Asking people on the street, and everybody was talking about one thing. Making myself happy, make myself happy. Success, rock and roll. Art, whatever it was they came up with is all about me, 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 me. We're in the ultimate me culture. And what's going on now is that human beings, you know, all over the world, not just in America, not just in America, the Bible talks about how in the last days that the message of Yeshua would go to the entire earth and then the end would come. Do you remember that? Matthew 24? Well, right now, yesterday, or day before yesterday, SpaceX just launched another 52 satellites into space. And they're in what we call the third orbital shell now. So you get the one, two, three. What this means is that by the end of this year, my friends, there will be no place on this planet. You could be standing on the North Pole. There is no place on this planet that you can't pull out your cell phone if you have the right software on it. Click and you can check in to the internet online. Right now, our missionaries in uh, New Guinea are using this. Our missionaries, how many of you know the series? Now, the, what, Terry and Cindy Siri are our missionaries in New Guinea. And what they're doing now is they're literally being flown by helicopter into the remotest places in New Guinea and being dropped off into the jungle. And they can go into these villages and they can literally pull out an iPad because all they need is a, a, is a signal from the satellite and a solar panel to power it. And they can show the Jesus film in the common language of New Guinea, which pretty much everybody speaks, even in the remote areas. And they are seeing people in villages that have never seen an outsider coming to Christ every day. 
That's what's happening right now. So you, you are reaching a point that has never existed in the history of the human race. Never. We're there. We're at the end. We're at this place. But you've got the whole world which is screaming me first. Our culture exalts whatever the individual says, this must be true. You've got an entire culture that says that if an individual says something is true, even if you don't think it's true, everybody must celebrate it because this person says it's true. Even if it's obviously not true. Well, I love uh, some parent the other day, uh, I saw it on the news, went to a school board member dressed as Julius Caesar. And he introduced himself as Julius Caesar. And he said, who are you to argue with me? I identify as Julius Caesar. <laughs> and it, they threw him out for some reason. But I mean, if a boy can say, I'm a girl and you must celebrate it, why can't this man stand up and say, I'm Julius Caesar and you must celebrate it? He's making a good point, don't you think? People ask me, they say, well, what are your preferred pronouns? And I say, your royal highness. Nobody has addressed me as your royal highness yet. I don't understand why they won't affirm my, my pronouns here. I just don't understand. I told you I was going to offend a lot of people. I'm just getting started. Verse 12. For the Lord of armies will have a day of reckoning against everyone who is arrogant and haughty. And against everyone who is lifted up, that he may be brought low. And it will be against all the cedars of Lebanon that are lofty and lifted up, against all the oaks of Bashan, against all the lofty mountains, against all the hills that are lifted up, against every high tower, against every fortified wall, against all the ships of Tarshish, and against all the delightful ships and the pride of humanity will be humbled, and the arrogance of people will be brought low, and the Lord alone will be exalted on that day. Now remember, I told you that Isaiah loves poetry, because he saw something in his vision, and he went... What God is going to do is he's going to look at you and I as human beings. And you see, this is, this is a description of the pride of man. We take down cedar trees like this one. How much bigger is that tree than these, guys, these loggers? We think we're so that because we can do this. And we do it all the time. I, I grew up in the logging business. We brought down trees this big. They're mightier than we, and yet we in our arrogance think we're so smart. We level mountains to build palaces. We build roads and bridges and giant skyscrapers that make you dizzy just looking at it. We build cruise ships that are basically Las Vegas in the middle of the ocean and aircraft carriers where we can take the power of our airplanes anywhere in the world in less than 12 hours. And God says, I'm going to take all of that and I'm going to bring it down low. And every single human being, no matter what kind of things you have built, no matter what kind of things you put, you put in your trust in, on that day, God and God alone will be exalted. And when he talks about arrogance, the arrogance of people will be brought low, and the Lord alone will be exalted. What does he mean by arrogance? And this is where I'm about to offend three quarters of this culture. Here we go. What does he mean by arrogance? You see, what people are doing is they are suggesting, listen carefully, they are suggesting that their opinion, the individual's opinion about how things should be is by far more important, by far more authoritative, and by far better than God's view of how things should be. Now talk about arrogance. But we don't see it that way. Well, let's think about it for a second. We've got people out there, for example, who are arguing loudly, screaming in the streets that their ideas about marriage have more validity than the God who called everything into existence out of nothing. He was the one that invented marriage. 
But we in our arrogance are going to say, no, two men can be married. Two women can be married. You can marry your dog. And if you think I'm crazy, they're doing that in the Netherlands already. Cross-species marriages. No, I'm not making that up. Look it up. Arrogance? You think? But to bring it home, how many professing Christians are out dating and after about the first, second, or third date, they're sleeping together? Why? Well, you know, everybody does. We can do it safely now. You've got entire cultures. I went to a Christian bookstore one time, and this really upset me. I was at a Christian bookstore. I'm just flipping through things. And here's a book, and I thought, oh, that looks interesting, and I'm just kind of flipping through. And I went to the... What? And I looked at, this is in a Christian bookstore where it openly says that fornication, i.e. having sex when you're not married, you're dating, is perfectly acceptable to God. Perfectly acceptable. Because the, all of those prohibitions against that, that's Old Testament, see? That's back there where they didn't understand STDs. But now we understand, you know, how to do these things safely. So you're, you're perfectly, let's go ahead, no, you're fine. 65%, but only 4% of a biblical worldview. Let me tell you what the biblical worldview is. One man, one woman, married for life. That's where sex occurs and no place else. That's it. There you go, kids. And, and, and people say, well, well we're going to get married anyway. So oh, you think your opinion is greater than God's. Well, good luck with that. We're going to get married anyway. No, just get married because that's what God said to do. But now we have an entire culture that is screaming that if I'm a boy, but I want to be a girl, you have to affirm it. We just went through, just a few days ago, Women's History Month, celebrating women. And so they were doing awards at the White House of the United States of America. And they're passing out awards for women except that they're men dressed as women, but they call themselves women, therefore we have to give them an award for being great women. How many of you know that women just got erased? But we have to affirm this now? You see, the opinions of men, that a man who thinks he's a woman, we have to, we have to celebrate this? We have to affirm this? No, you see, l let me be clear on this. An idol is a false God. That means it's something that people affirm, esteem, lift up, worship, but it's a rock. So if somebody comes to me and demands that I worship their choice, I'm not going for it because I don't worship false gods. How many of you understand this? So I don't care if somebody comes to me and screaming in my face, you must call me a boy when I'm actually a girl. I'm saying, I'm sorry, I don't bear false witness. I don't worship false gods. You can scream all you want. You can collect me with my friends and take me down to be eaten by the lions. It don't matter to me. Because I serve the living God. How many of you are with me? See, it's all pride. Because you see, and they even call it pride. That's what they call their parades, which cracks me up. Okay. Why? Because no one, listen, no one picks their own biology. Again, you did not exist before you existed in order to cause your existence. You did not sit in your mother's womb and go, oh, I like that DNA right there. You didn't pick it, guys. When that egg and sperm came together, let's think about it for a second. I taught 10th grade biology, so I'll give you a lesson. That's how it works, babes. And that's how it works. Mom produces an egg. Dad produces a sperm. When these two get together, something happens. It's both biological and spiritual. In that moment, a new being begins to exist. It is an eternal being. And God designed this back with Adam and Eve. And that breath of life that he breathed into Adam has been passed down to Adam's sons and daughters all the way to this very morning. God made you. 
And if God said you're a girl, you're a girl. I don't care if you like it or not. And I'm sure every 28 days you don't. But (laughs) I was a biology teacher. I'm sorry. But if you were conceived as a boy, you are a boy. God said that. So to demand that and to say, well, I feel differently, it doesn't matter what your feelings are because when when you're using your feelings, what you're saying is that you are smarter than God. You have more authority than God. And this is a warning from the prophets that the day is going to come when all human pride will be brought low. And on that day, he and he alone will be exalted. And in that day, there is no argument against him. The idols will completely vanish. People will go into caves of of rocks and into holes in the ground, away from the terror of the Lord and the splendor of His majesty. This day is coming when He arises to terrify the earth. This is coming. And on that day, people will throw away to the moles and the bats their idols of silver and their idols of gold, which they made for themselves to worship in order to go into the clefts of the rocks and the crannies of the cliffs before the terror of the Lord and the splendor of His majesty when He arises to terrify the earth. So what's the conclusion? Take no account of man whose breath of life is in his nostrils for why should he be esteemed? See, in the end, God's authority, listen to me on this, God's authority about how things should be is going to be proved right. There will be no argument against him in that day. So he says here, why should we esteem? What does he mean by esteem? To lift up in importance the opinion and the desires of men. So I go back to what we started with. Why are we afraid of the crowd? I know they're loud. I know they call you names. Because you're trying to stand for Yeshua. And they say awful things about you on social media. And you know that you have to turn the other cheek and not say awful things back to them because we're not called to be obnoxious. We're just called to stand on the truth. And it's hard to love when your enemies are screaming in your face. I understand. I understand. But will you fear him more than you fear their opinion of you? Do not lift up the esteem of men. And that includes your own family members. I have family members, several. Several. That I've actually had to block on Facebook and they are family because they attack my, posi- my, my beliefs so much, I literally had to block them, and they are family. That's hard. And I still have to see them at certain family gatherings, and that's a little fun. Screaming at me because I'm such a bigot and a hater because I won't affirm this stuff. But I know that the God who created the stars has sworn by himself that his word is true. And he said, I am going to terrify the earth and every pride will be brought low. And in that day, there's no argument. So why are you taking account and esteeming the opinions of men now? Don't go there. And that, my friends, is the key. This is everything we're talking about. You and I must decide not to elevate what the culture thinks more than what God says. We must understand a biblical worldview. We must teach this view. We must stand on this view. No matter the cost. So I call upon you in Jesus' name. I call upon you in Jesus' name. To make up your mind and your heart. And I know that many of you are looking at me going, boy, you're, you're preaching to the choir. No, I'm preaching what Isaiah said, what the Holy Spirit said through him. And we go through the Bible chapter by chapter and verse by verse. And this is what was next. So I call upon you. Stand. One of the hardest things that you're going to do is to speak the truth in love. If you water down what you believe when you're talking to somebody because you don't want that person to be mad at you, then you just sacrifice them for your own comfort. 
Because it does the person you're talking to exactly zero good if you lie. Tell them the truth or say nothing. Tell them the truth, period. I'm not trying to be offensive to you, but this is where I stand because I live by a biblical worldview. And they're screaming at you and go, fine. But I won't back down. Let's pray. Holy Father, we come before you in Yeshua's name. Jesus' name. And here we are. Here we are again, Father God. I went through this room, Lord, shaking hands, and I met a lot of new people, so I cannot assume that everybody who came in that door knows you. And so with every head bowed and every eye shut so that nobody is embarrassed, and I'm not asking you to raise a hand. I'm not asking you to do anything. I'm asking you just to do what we're talking about here in your own heart, in the quiet. You, God, and my voice. If you have not sworn your loyalty to God alone, if you have not recognized that you have offended God, that's what a sinner is. I'm a sinner. I'm not calling you a sinner. I'm saying I know you because I is you. I'm a sinner too. I have done and said and thought things that the God of heaven and earth utterly hates. And I am guilty, but so are you. And if you have not cried out to him from the heart, asking him to forgive you of that, if you have not sworn your loyalty to him as king and God, I warn you, as the prophet did, the days of his judgment are near. He will bring all human pride low. And on that day, only he will be exalted. So if you swear your loyalty to him now, he will save you from the wrath that is to come. And the way you do that, my friend, is simple. But it has to be from the heart. Just say to him this, Father God, I confess I have done and said and thought things that you hate. I have sinned. But I ask you to forgive me of my sin. I believe that Jesus died on a Roman cross to be a perfect substitute for me. I believe he rose again from the dead. And right here, right now, I swear my loyalty to you and you alone for the rest of my days. Father God, I pray for your people. If there's anyone here who prayed this prayer, I pray that you draw them to the front to be prayed for by this prayer team. I pray, Father God, that if there's anybody in this room struggling with sickness, struggling with depression, struggling with addiction, struggling with anything, you are the healer. You are the God who does great and mighty things. And so I pray, Father God, that you draw them to the front that our prayer team may lay hands on them, anointing with, them with oil. And Holy Spirit, I call upon you to do great things among the people who come to the front. And I pray these things in Yeshua's name. And everybody said, Amen.